All right, welcome back. Today is gonna be the start of my nostalgia reviews, which is a new kind of review that I'm gonna be doing on the channel. Recently, one of you suggested to me in the comments that I should take a book that I read a long time ago, reread it, and then give my new perspective on the book. And I've decided that I think that's a great idea, and so that's what I'm gonna be doing in my nostalgia reviews. And today we're gonna be talking about one of the first books that had a massive impact on me, and that is The God of Small Things by Arundhati Roy. I first read this book when I was in high school in sixth form for my English literature class, and I have vivid memories of staying up really late one night in my conservatory at home and just being completely engrossed and fascinated by this book. So much so that I read the whole thing in one day. I reread this book recently for a book club that I'm part of, so I thought it would be a really good time to kick my reviews off with this book. I have to say, my positive feelings towards the book haven't changed all that much over the years, but there are certainly some things that I have noticed a lot more reading the book as someone who's a little bit older and a little more aware of things. All right, let's get started. Part one, summary. The events of The God of Small Things are revealed in a fragmentary manner, mostly jumping back and forth between scenes in 1969 and 1993, with a backstory scattered throughout. The story centers around the wealthy, land-owning, Syrian Christian E.P. family of Ayemenem, a town in Kerala, India. Most of the plot occurs in 1969, focusing on the seven-year-old twins, Esther and Rahel, who live with their mother, Amu, their grandmother, Mamachi, their uncle, Chako, and their great-aunt, Baby Kachama. The focus of the plot is a family tragedy that tore the family apart during the summer of 1969. The blame for the tragedy is placed on Rahel and Esther's mother, Amu, because she is seen as breaking the sacred love laws that dictate who should be loved and how, and how much. The scenes in 1993 see Rahel and Esther reunited for the first time since the tragedy in the 60s. These scenes allow Roy to explore the consequences and psychological impact of the tragedy. Part two, the personal is political. The God of Small Things is definitely a family saga, and it's the family tragedy that's very much at the heart of the novel. When I read the story for the first time, I really found myself connecting mostly with Amu, Rahel, and Esther, and my emotional investment in the story and the tragedy was very much focused on these three characters. But one thing that Roy does in The God of Small Things is that she mixes the personal family tragedy with broader social and political issues, and this is something that I didn't pick up on so much when I was younger. Three of the big things that Roy focuses on in her book are the relationships between men and women in India, communism, and the caste system. And the book is littered with characters who support these various ideologies and ideas, but actually turn out to be quite hypocritical. For example, there are lots of communist characters who have positions of political power, and they seem to be reaping the advantages of those positions in a way that isn't all that communist. When I first read the story, I found these parts of the story quite boring, especially the communist stuff. Mainly this is because Roy will go on like massive digressions about communism and the political situation at the time, and I just didn't find those things interesting. And to be honest, to some extent, I still don't, but I can appreciate a lot more why this stuff is in the book this time around. Back when I read the story for the first time, I found that Baby Kachama was the big villain of the story, and I really, really hated her for the cruel and terrible things that she does. And to be honest, I still can't stand her. I think she's just a terrible, horrible cow. But I could appreciate that the actual villain of the story isn't just Baby Kachama, and there are much broader social and political things going on, influencing the more personal decisions and the personal family tragedy at the heart of the story. Roy spends a lot of time on this political and social commentary because one of the aspects of the story that is important is her showing how these social and political issues ultimately cause or at least have a big influence on the family tragedy. And this is reflected in one of the big recurring motifs throughout The God of Small Things. Roy will often point out that Amu and Esther and Rahel have broken these sacred love laws which lay down who should be loved and how much. And it's the breaking of these laws, which are essentially society's laws about who you should and shouldn't be in love with, that causes the family tragedy. In Amu's case, she sleeps with Valutha, who is someone who is low down on the caste system. He's an untouchable, and therefore is certainly not someone that a touchable like Amu should be sleeping with. Another example of how Roy does this is when she's talking about 
police brutality at one point, she describes the police as just agents of history. And she seems to be implying that the police are just agents of some greater force outside of themselves, i.e. the social and political system. So this was something that I really did pick up on this time, the ways in which the political and social climate interact with people's personal decisions. That's not to say that the book reduces everything and all the characters' actions to political things. It's not quite as reductive as that. It's certainly still true that someone like Baby Kachama is a bitter, nasty person who's quite spiteful. And while some of her spite might be influenced by societal things that have happened to her, it could also just be that that's the sort of person that she is. And certainly I still saw her as a very big villain because of the things that she does. And it's certainly no excuse for her character to say, well, you know, she was just a product of her society because she still does some pretty terrible things. But that being said, in line with my younger self, I'm still not a massive fan of the political digressions in the story. What I find most interesting about The God of Small Things to this day is that personal family saga story. And those are the bits of the story where I think Roy's writing is a lot more interesting, where I think there's a lot more going on, whereas the political stuff just really does sometimes feel like a digression, especially when we get to the communist stuff and she just talks about it for ages and ages and ages. It almost reminds me a bit of like the early parts of 1984, where you just have a lot of exposition about what the world is like in a way that to me is a detriment to the book in the sense that it does kind of slow the pacing down, it kind of takes you away from the central focus of the story a bit, and so it's not something that I am a massive fan of. That being said, I can certainly appreciate what Roy is doing and why that stuff is there, because it's certainly important for the kind of story she's trying to tell. Part 3. Noticing the Small Things So one of the big themes of The God of Small Things, and it is very much implied by the title, is how small moments and small things can have very big and unexpected impacts later on. Now, obviously when I was learning about this book in school, this was the thing that the teacher, I think it was one of the first things that they mentioned, because one of the first things that we did was we looked at the title and we thought, well, you know, what could this mean? And then whenever it kind of came up throughout the story, this idea of the big things and the small things interacting with each other, the teacher would always point it out. But to be honest, because this theme is all about details and small things, it wasn't something that I could fully appreciate back then when I was mostly just reading this to, you know, study it and pass an exam. And I also think it's the sort of thing, and it's the sort of book, where to pick up on all these moments, you really do need to read it time and time again, because there's just so much going on. So that being said, I found that I could appreciate this theme a lot more reading it again all these years later. One nice thing about this book is that it is just full of the notes that I made all the way back then. So as I was rereading it, I was able to remind myself of the things that I was saying back then about the book. And whenever there were these little moments, I was, you know, there are kind of my little underlines. And it was fun to just notice them and reflect on them all this time later. And there were a few new things that I noticed as well. One thing that I picked up on this time that I didn't pick up on last time was, again, Baby Kachama's character and something that motivates her to do what she later does in the story. So early in the story, we have this scene where Baby Kachama, Rahel, Amu and Cheko are in a car on the way to the cinema and they're stopped by a communist parade and one of the communists humiliates Baby Kachama. And she's very embarrassed by this because she's a very prideful woman and she finds these communists to be disgusting. Now also at this communist parade, Rahel thinks that she spots Valutha, who is the man who Amu eventually uh, ends up having a thing with. And Baby Kachama then associates Valutha with communists. And this humiliation that she feels is projected onto him and her need for revenge is projected onto him. And so this small moment of humiliation later on has a massive impact on the story. Another example of how a small thing can have a massive impact on a character later is a moment in which Amu says to Rahel when she misbehaves that she loves her a little less. And this is something that preys on Rahel's mind constantly throughout the story. Even into adulthood, she's still remembering this moment. And this is probably something that Amu as a character probably forgot quite quickly. She probably just thought that she was trying to teach her daughter a lesson and that it wouldn't have any profound impact on her. But actually it does. Constantly throughout the story, Rahel is in a kind of mania about whether or not her mother loves her. And this is something that she carries with her forever. And to be honest, it also shows Amu to be not the greatest parent. I think when I read this for the first time, I was a lot more sympathetic towards Amu, and I still am to a large extent. But 
I certainly picked up on some of the things that she does with her kids that is, you know, quite manipulative and not the sort of thing you'd expect, you know, someone who's going to win the Mother of the Year award to be doing. So this kind of picking up on these small things definitely changed my view of the characters in the story a lot more. I've already said that when I read the story back then, I really did see Amu and Esther and Rahel and Volutha as well, actually, as the main victims of the story, and I empathised with them a lot. And I saw the likes of Baby Kachama as, you know, the ultimate villain. And to be honest, my allegiances are still more or less the same, but I can certainly appreciate now that these characters are more psychologically complex than I first gave them credit for. Amu is definitely a flawed mother. She's not a great mother, and I don't think I'd really want her as my mother. She's quite a bitter person, and she does resort to manipulative tactics with her kids every now and then. And baby Kachama, although she becomes a very embittered and horrible person, you know, she was, as we see in the story, once a very romantic soul, and she just couldn't have what she wanted because of society. And so I do find it a bit easier to at least empathise with the characters, even if I still do certainly see some characters as less good than others. Part 4. Tragedy and Structure so one thing that has pretty much stayed the same in terms of my attitudes towards the book back then and now, although now I think I can appreciate it more on a technical level, is the structure of the book and how the structure of the book makes the book even more tragic. Now to talk about this I am going to have to reveal some big spoilers about the book, so if you care about spoilers uh, maybe don't watch any more of the video, although I will say that The God of Small Things is a book that will spoil its endings for you because it's told out of time, and so you learn a lot of the tragedy early on in the story anyway. But still, for those of you that care, there's your spoiler warning. So The God of Small Things is told in a non-chronological order. We begin the story with Rahel and Esther being reunited in Iemenon after many years apart from each other, and the story returns to them every now and then in the present day, but is constantly flipping back and forward through time throughout that. And very early on in the story, we learn that Rahel and Esther's mother Amu is dead, and so is her lover, Belutha. Roy actually gives us Amu's death scene very early on in the book. I think it might even be less than a third into the book, or maybe about a third, is where her death scene occurs. And it's a pretty harrowing scene. She's lost everything. She's lost her children, her beauty, her intelligence, and she's very ill, and she dies alone in a cheap motel room with no one there to care for her. And this to me, this telling the story out of time, makes it even more tragic. Because then, after this point, for the rest of the story, you see Amu struggling and going through all the things that she's going through, but you already know how it's going to turn out for her, because you saw this right at the beginning of the story. And so by telling the story out of order, it actually makes it more tragic. It's kind of like Greek tragedy in the sense that you already know how things are going to pan out for the characters, and you're still really interested to see how that's going to occur, and for some reason that makes it all the worse. Because as you're watching the character, you've always got in your mind, yeah, but this is what's going to happen to you in the end. Despite this excess of tragedy, Roy actually does manage to make an optimistic ending for the story. The very ending of the story shows Amu and Volutha sharing a night of passion together, and telling us little tidbits about their very brief romance. In fact, it's only in this last chapter that Roy gives us an insight into this relationship. Outside of this, there are just small little tidbits that something's going on, but we don't actually know anything about why they like each other or what they do together. And this creates a wonderful, bittersweet effect. It's bitter because you're reading the end of the story, so it feels like and this is the natural conclusion, but you know that it isn't the natural conclusion because you know that Volutha and Amu are dead, and you know that all the tragic things have happened. But at the same time, because it's the end of the story, and it's a very happy scene, and it's somewhat optimistic, it does make things feel a lot less tragic in a sense, or at least sweet, and that's why I say bittersweet for the ending. I think also it shows that Roy, as a storyteller, wants to tell a uplifting story. Although a tragedy is at the heart of the story, she's choosing to end the story at a happy moment, at a happy time, and she doesn't care that this time happened, you know, before Amu died and before the tragedies occurred, because it doesn't matter to her. In Roy's world, you're telling a story, and so you don't need to follow the constraints of time. And so what you can do then, is you can mention the tragic stuff, because it happened, but you can choose to end the story by picking a time in which things were, you know, reasonably happy. And that's what Roy does, and I think it's just a beautiful way to end the story, and it's what's always given me such a big emotional impact when I've read it. It's kind of like thinking about death in general, in a way. You know, you could either choose to remember someone on their deathbed, in pain and suffering, 
or you could choose to remember them as they were in life where they're happy and free and everything's great. And Roy seems to be doing that in this story. She doesn't want to focus on the negative stuff and she doesn't want to leave you, you know, weeping, although in a way she does do that. She wants to leave things at a happy moment and that's what the end of the story does. So when it comes to me and fiction, it's very rare that I'll ever like actually get teary-eyed when I'm reading something, but The God of Small Things is one of those books that actually did that for me. And that certainly happened back when I read it for the first time. It didn't happen this time, and I think probably that's just because I knew where the story was going, but you know, it still made me feel something, and I think that's why it's always stood out in my mind as one of the best things I've ever read. And I think a big part of its ability to have that emotional impact is in its structure. It's the fact that Roy is choosing to tell a story where she tells you everything, all the bad things that happen early on, and then chooses to end the story on this happy moment, because it just makes it all the more bittersweet and all the more tragic, knowing that this isn't really the ending, at least not in terms of chronological time. Part 5, Conclusion. So overall, my enjoyment of The God of Small Things hasn't really changed all that much over time. I still think it's one of the best books that I've ever read, and I can't recommend it enough. That being said, there are a few things that have changed in terms of the things that I've noticed and the things that I've focused on. I noticed a lot more of the politics and social commentary in the book this time around, probably just because I'm more aware of these issues in general now, being a bit older, and so these were things that I actually appreciated a little bit more, although I would say they still weren't my favourite parts of the book. I much more prefer the family saga and the characters and that tragedy, and less so the digressions about politics. I can also appreciate the structure of the story a lot more. It was certainly something that I did notice back then, but now I can really see how it's the structure and the way that Roy is telling the story that allows it to have such a big emotional impact. Although, of course, the prose is wonderfully beautiful and poetic as well. Probably the thing that changed the most in terms of my perspective on the book were the characters. Back then, I really did see the story in a more black and white sense with heroes and villains, and this time I think I have a much more nuanced approach to the characters. Even if I still think that some characters are worse than others, I can at least empathise with people's motivations and understand them a bit more than I think I could in the past. But overall, it's still just a fantastic book. It will hit you like a ton of bricks, but in a very good way. So definitely, if you haven't read it, give it a read. All right, that's it for this nostalgia review. Let me know what you think of The God of Small Things and the things that I've said about it. And let me know what you think about this review format. I think it's quite nice to talk about a book in this kind of reflective way and seeing how your views of it have changed over time. So if you enjoy hearing me do that, then let me know, and I'll definitely continue to make videos in this format in the future. But that's it for this video. I look forward to talking with you in the comments. Ta-ra!